Come with me to the Psalms. We're going to open up Psalm 119. I had an idea for this series that as we're going through these parables, which are in many ways challenging and in many ways mysterious and and difficult to understand, um, it's going to be many weeks of this. And and Psalm 119, if you've never read it, is an amazing uh, acrostic poem where, where David goes through all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet and he expresses his joy and his love for the word of God, for the law of God, for God revealing to him his teachings, revealing to him the way of life. And so it's, it's just an amazing prayer, I think, as we go through these challenging teachings to invite the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, we, we want to understand, we want to know, we want to we wanna be able to experience your goodness and, and thank you for all that you've already revealed to us and help us even more to walk in what you have for us. So Every week we're going to be going through Psalm 119 because it's really long. <laughs> and so there's, it's perfect. It's segmented out by the letters. Uh, and so we start with Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And that's Psalm 119, starting in verse 1. It says this. How happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk according to the Lord's instruction. Happy are those who keep his decrees and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. You have commanded that your precepts be diligently kept. If only my ways were committed to keeping your statutes. I, I, I have made that prayer many times. And I would not be ashamed. When I think about all your commands, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Never abandon me. Pray with me. Lord, help us to be in that place where we can say that we walk blamelessly with you. Lord, that like Noah before the flood in a world of of darkness and, and strife, you can look upon us and say that is a man or a woman, a child of God who walks with me. God, we know it's a process. And help us in that because so often we look to the law or we look to your word and we look to your commands and we feel shame at our own faults and brokenness and our shortcomings. And we should in a way, but we also need to cry out to you, Lord, help us. Because you are faithful. As Alan sang so well in that last song, your faithfulness, God, is just unending. And even though we struggle and we stumble and we, we, we fall at times, God, you're with us. You're lifting us up. And so I just ask as we go into this series on parables, God, would you open our hearts, our minds, our ears to see things we've never seen, hear things we've never heard, learn from the Spirit, God, that we would become more like you, true sons and daughters of God, and keep ourselves unstained from the world, keep ourselves pure and blameless in your sight. God, you're awesome. And I just pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So the Lord has blessed me this week because right as we're about to start a new series, which is really important, I gained some of my pastoral authority back with the beard returning. And so I, I've regained a little bit of confidence. Uh, <laughs> I look a little less like a 16-year-old, although it's still pretty, pretty, pretty uh, low here. So, but I'm glad that it's, it's, it's rolling along because, man, this series is going to be fun, but there's going to be times it's tough. And, and so I, I just, I think it's timed out just perfectly. Um, of course it has. But, but when we start to come back here and, and work together and, and, and go through the word together, we'll be able to chew on this a little bit more deeply as a community. And, and we've thrown around some creative ways we're going to do that. But, but overall, that's the goal, right? As a, as a church body, that we would be in awe of Jesus's teachings, not try to feel like we can, we can understand it perfectly or obey it perfectly, but just trust him and walk with him. So that's what we're going to be doing. And, and so I want to give a little bit of an introduction to parables because they're going to be um, interesting. I think they're, they're misunderstood in many ways, misused in many ways. And so we have to be cautious in our approach to them. And so I just want to open with that because in truth, the disciples, the people that Jesus is interacting with, they do have some base level knowledge about 
what a parable is, what it means, um, why, why it's being used, at least in some sense. And I feel like we don't necessarily have that. So I kind of want to fill in that context and then we'll, we'll let Jesus take it, take it from there. But here's the basic thing I want you to, to imagine in your mind, okay? A parable in many ways is, is a kind of figurative, symbolic, analogy, story that, that Jesus uses as a vehicle um, to, to bring truth in a very deep and profound way in, in not very many words. <laughs> it's, it's usually pretty short. It's usually pretty succinct, but it is a, a depth that is just uh, beyond comprehension. Jesus is going to bring things to our attention that we will have to chew on and walk with really our entire lives. And that's why these, these short stories are so powerful. But here's some other things you may not know about parables. The book of Proverbs, book of Proverbs, right after the Psalms, we've read it a few times to open our service. That word, Proverbs, okay? In the Hebrew, it's mashal. But when you look at the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it is parabole, parables. And so the title of the book of Proverbs is actually parables. And there's a weird story about how English has over time, right, different languages, different translations, and things have separated. And we've talked about this with like Jesus's name before, right, that his name is really Joshua, and it's the exact same as, as the Hebrew biblical Old Testament story of Joshua, same name, but different stories of how language changes over time. You get Jesus and Joshua being two separate names. Um, it's the same thing here. Proverbs is really just parable. And so when you think of the primary example of parables in the Old Testament, in the context of what Jesus is coming into with the, the Jewish people here, it's the book of Proverbs. And if you've ever read the book of Proverbs, you know that there are these short, wise sayings, so to speak. You know, some people look at them like they're, you know, fortune cookie type sayings. That's not really the whole breadth of it, but it, it is these wise sayings, these, these, these small capsules in which there's the wisdom and truth of God contained about real life and, and practical things, but very often they're analogies and sometimes they're tough to understand, but, but there's just these little nuggets of wisdom, so to speak. And that is the primary mode of parables in the scripture until Jesus, okay? And you're going to notice when we get into Jesus's teachings, they're a little bit longer than most of the Proverbs are, although there are some uh, parables in the Proverbs that are pretty, pretty long, like Lady Wisdom in, in, in those chapters. But for the most part, Jesus' uh, parables are a little bit deeper. Another place that parables show up in the Old Testament is Balaam in, in Numbers chapter 23. Now, if you're not familiar with this story, in essence, there's this pagan priest, prophet um, figure who, who is going to curse the nation of Israel as they pass by on the way to the promised land, but God intervenes and in essence makes him bless them three times. And when Balaam gives these blessings, he opens them by saying that they are a parable. They are parables. They are mashal. They are, each one of those is a, is a parable. They're a prophecy of what is going to happen to Israel. Parables are also analogies. And so th there's so much to it, but I just want you to have in your mind the idea of a, a short but deep figurative analogy of sorts that, that really contains amazing truth, but that you really need the Spirit of God to, to open that to you. So that's the main idea. So let's get into the passage for today. We're in Matthew. We're in chapter 13. Remember last weekend where we ended? It's going to be very, very important for today. The last week we ended with, with Jesus' family showing up and, and they're really embarrassed. They are in kind of panic mode. They hear Jesus uh, really arguing with the Pharisees in many ways, calling them out, and, and they show up to, in essence, drag Jesus away. Remember we read the Mark uh, telling of the story and their, their goal was to restrain him, literally to grab him physically and pull him out so that he would stop speaking, that he, they could get him out of the situation and he could stop embarrassing them. And we talked about how Jesus was at this time probably the head of the family. And, and so he was uh, bringing shame and dishonor, so to speak, to them in their minds. And, and they were trying to intervene and, and, and stop that from happening. And so it was a tragic scene. Uh, but by the end of that, Jesus says, here are my disciples. 
They're the ones who do the will of my Father in heaven, right? And, and what's the will of the Father in heaven to, to believe on the Son? And so that's where we left off. And here we are in chapter 13, and it says this. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. And so that's why I said it's so important. We know last week, right? On that day, same day, Jesus' family shows up to pull him out. He goes out of the house and was sitting by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down while the whole crowd stood on the shore. So there's this huge crowd forming. And, you know, this passage amazes me in so many ways because over the last several weeks, I mean, we've talked about some of the hardest, most challenging, most faith-shaking teachings of Jesus, really. We've talked about the unforgivable sin and, and blaspheming the Holy Spirit. We've talked about Jesus denouncing most of the towns he, he did his miracles in because they didn't believe. We talked about so many things in, in this process, and it's been tough. But imagine the, the scene, the context, right? Jesus has gone through all of these really hard teachings where he's just speaking the truth clearly to the people. And, and what do we see? Do we see that, that there's nobody left? Nobody's following him anymore because his teachings are just too hard. That's not what we see. We see large crowds, so large that he has to get into a boat and go off a little bit into the sea to be able to address the whole crowd. For me, that is so powerful because what it communicates to us is that, listen, at the end of the day, you can have this mindset. What really means to be a Christian is I'm going to save all these people and I'm going to draw all these people. And as a church, we get into that mentality way too often. If, well, as long as we got big crowds, as long as we got all this going, and, and maybe I just need to adjust the way I speak and my message a little bit to make it a little easier so, so more people will come because that's the goal. We want all these people here. But here's Jesus speaking in many ways in a harsh sense, but, but truthfully, brutally honest. He's speaking the truth of God and the realness of it, and the crowds are there, right? But what we're going to learn in this passage is that just because there's a crowd, right, it doesn't mean that all these people, man, they're listening, and they're changing, and they're, they're experiencing the Spirit, and they're walking the walk of faith. They, they might be there for many, many different reasons. And by the end of this, we'll see that the majority of this huge crowd are really on the outside, okay? They're, they're not really believing. They're not really seeing. They're not really hearing. And, and so we got to take our eyes off of, wow, it's all about drawing people. It's all about big crowds, big churches, lots of things going on. We got tons of people in and out. Man, don't miss it. It's not about the big, large crowd, right? Jesus is going to show us that here in just a minute. So here we go, verse three. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, our first one, consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground and produced fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty times what was sown. Let anyone who has ears listen. And the disciples came up and asked him, why are you speaking to them in parables? I love the heart of the disciples here. I really, really do. There's many times they'll come and ask Jesus questions and you're going, what in the, what are you doing here? But here, I, 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 I get it. I get it, right? He tells this story, okay, this parable, and we're going to see in a minute why. But, but I love the heart that says, why are you speaking to them? In parable, there, there's this huge crowd. You have this opportunity. Just tell them forthrightly. Just, just say what the kingdom of God is all about. Just, just tell them. Why are you speaking to them in parables? But Jesus is going to get the truth of it right here and, and, and teach them and us something about crowds, something about the Christian life, something about discipleship I think is really important. He says this in verse 11. He answered, because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given for you to know, but it has not been given to them. All right, I want to read that again because that's a, I mean, we got to, guys, we got to chew on this. 
And, and many times I've had people, this is one of those passages in the church. Drew, I, man, I don't get this. Why, why would Jesus say this? Why? All right, so let's, let's we got to chew on it together. What does it say? Because the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given for you to know, the disciples, but it has not been given to them. For whoever has, more will be given to him, and he will have more than enough. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. That is why I speak to them in parables. Because looking, they do not see, and hearing, they do not listen or understand. Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them, which says, you will listen and listen, but never understand. You will look and look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown callous. Their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their ears and hear with, or sorry, see with their eyes, see with their ears, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn back and I would heal them. Okay, so there's, there's two aspects of this that I don't want us to miss that are, that are playing out at the same time and, and are, are related to why Jesus speaks in these kind of riddles almost, these stories, these figurative stories where it's not so easy to get what he's saying. In some cases, it's impossible without the explanation, right, and the movement of the Spirit. Well, we get that end of that, and then we also get the reason why the people aren't hearing, they aren't listening. They aren't seeing. So, so what do we get? In the first then, Jesus tells the disciples, it's been given to you, but it hasn't been given to them. There is a reality, and, and we're going to see this. We've seen it actually previously in Matthew. If you remember back to the Sermon on the Mount, what does Jesus say to the disciples? Don't cast your pearls before, what, pigs, because they might turn and, and trample you, right? There's a reality, Okay. That God, in certain places, in certain times, with certain people, veils the truth. He, he, he gives the truth in such a way that they will not receive it. They will not understand it. They will not, they will not get the full picture. Because God, in his timing, in, in his ways, reveals to people the truth. And at the end of the day, God has a monopoly on truth. He has a monopoly on what it means to be, to be good, what it means to be righteous, what it means to follow him, what it means to be redeemed. It belongs to him. And he can reveal it as he wills, to whom he wills, when he wills. And there's a sense in which in Jesus' ministry, there are many times where Jesus looks at the crowd and, and he sees the hearts and the, the men and the individuals that are there. And, and in his following of the obedient will of the Father, right, he, he chooses to veil the truth because it's not for their eyes, it's not for their ears, it's not for their hearts. Okay, but there are those, the disciples in this case, who it is for them. And so he teaches in parables. And over the rest of the series that we're in parables, which is many, many chapters now, we're gonna see this. Jesus over and over and over again is going to teach parables. And I don't want you to miss this because what did the people in the crowd receive from Jesus? Right, They received this story of the sower, but we're about to receive the explanation of the story of the sower. Right, That they did not receive. The disciples in private, wherever they are, whether they join Jesus on the boat or whether they're in the house now, whatever it is, they're the ones who receive the fullness of what this parable means. But you and I have the blessing because we have the word of God from the disciples to be able to see and hear the explanation that Jesus provides for this. So we have this end of things, but then I don't want to just leave that there, okay? Because truth is often in attention, okay? It's often in tension. And if you just focus on one end, so God has the right to reveal truth to whom he wants, when he wants, how he wants. He has the right to hide it, and he does at times hide truth so that people won't see it, right? The, the, the next natural question is then, then God's really taken away any opportunity for these people in this crowd to know him and be saved. Why would he do that? Why wouldn't he want them to turn, right, and be healed? But let's hear what Jesus says. He says in verse 14, Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them. This is the other end of the tension. You will listen and listen, but never understand. You will look and look, but never perceive. Why? For this people's heart has grown callous. Their ears are hard of hearing and they have shut their eyes. 
Do you hear the other end of the tension, right? They have shut their eyes. I think of, you know, little kids, right? If you ever worked in children's ministry, what do they do when they don't want to hear something? <laughs> right? They'll cover their ears, la, 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 right? I'm not, I'm not listening to you. I'm not listening to you. I won't hear what you have to say, right? Uh, this is something kids do all the time, but I, I want to just speak honestly, and this is to my own heart too. As adults, we do this all the time. We do. We choose not to see when it challenges us, when it hits our worldview, when it breaks down the things that we've been raised up to believe. We do. We choose not to see the evil that happens in the world when it is done by things and people that we support. Right? We choose to close our eyes to all sorts of things all the time. We choose to close our ears all the time. You know, I, I, I can't count the number of times where I have read certain passages of Scripture and, and then just ignored it. I mean, it's just reality. It's happened so many times. And then gone back later years after and read the same passage and gone, wow, wow. <laughs> I just, I've heard this passage a thousand times and I chose to close. I just said, no, I don't want to hear it, right? This happens all the time, guys. So why are the people not receiving, right? In Isaiah's situation and Jesus applies it to his because they, they're shutting their ears and their eyes and they're going, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it, right? Their hearts have grown hard. They're in their own way. They're on their own path. And look at that, they, they, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn back and I would heal them. Do you hear the grace of God? If they would have turned back, I would heal them. I, I love that truth. That is a beautiful, amazing truth that when we turn back, we are healed. Let's keep hearing from Jesus. So we have both ends of that tension. The, the reality God gets to choose but then also the reality that we also have a, a part to play in this and we close our eyes and our hearts and our ears all the time. Here's verse 16. Blessed are your eyes because they do see and your ears because they do hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see the things that you see but didn't see them and to hear the things you hear but didn't hear them. I want you to notice this too. This is so important. Jesus mentions who? Prophets and righteous people, right? In many ways, he just referenced Isaiah, right? Isaiah didn't get the full picture that the disciples are now getting from Jesus. In other words, the spirit moving and opening eyes and opening hearts and, and revealing what he wants to reveal to them has nothing to do with the level of righteousness you've attained. It has nothing to do with the level of obedience you've attained. It has nothing to do, even if you are a prophet of God in the Old Testament, you were, you were obeying what God had called you to do. You were being faithful and God was revealing all of this truth. God has the right to reveal as much as he chooses to and to hold back as much as he chooses to. And it has nothing to do with, well, if I was just a great person, God would show me everything and I know all the answers. Well, no, God has a plan and he's revealing the way he wants to. So I want you to hear this invitation. So we see this tension, right? And, and we recognize this. Jesus is gonna invite us in now to hear the parable of the sower, okay? So I wanna invite you in to hear the parable of the sower as well. So listen, Jesus says, verse 18, to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word, okay? Here's the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it. The evil one comes, and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. And the one sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. But he has no root and is short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he falls away. Now the one sown among the thorns, this is one who hears the word, but the worries of this age... And the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But the one sown on the good ground, this is one who hears and understands the word, who does produce fruit and yields some a hundred, 
some 60, some 30 times what was sown. All right, so one of the rare occasions, and it's a perfect thing to start the series of parables, where Jesus just lays it out and he explains every detail of the parable. It makes it nice and, and simple for us to hear what he has to say. And I appreciate that here as we get started with this series. But let's go through each piece here. So we see the, the seed that falls along the path right? It falls along the path. It falls on this hard ground where there's nowhere for it to go. And it doesn't grow. It doesn't, it doesn't take root. It doesn't go into the soil. It, it, the birds come and snatch it and eat it and, and take it away. And, and Jesus says, this is the devil's work. There are people who are so calloused in their hardness of heart that they don't understand anything that's being said. And they just, they don't care. <laughs> they, they're entirely disinterested. They don't really even want to know what's being said. It falls on the path, so to speak, and the devil comes and takes it and it's gone. Then there's people, right? The one who's sown on the rocky ground, who hear the word and immediately receive it with joy. So there's some growth here. There's a, there's a seed that falls. It has enough soil to, to, to sink in and the seed dies and starts to grow into a plant of sorts, but it's it's shallow, right? It's sitting on something. The roots can't grow down. They can't grab. They can't get deep. So when trouble comes in this sense, when the sun shines, right? And there's no way for the plant to get water. There's no way the plant to get food. There's no way for it to be stable. It scorches and dies, right? And Jesus says that that is the reality of people who hear the word, take it with joy, but then persecution comes, hardship comes, difficulty comes, loss comes, uh, illness comes, the, the weight of the world comes, and because they don't have a deep root, they fall away. Then you have people or seeds that fall on the, um, uh, the, the, the good soil, but it's by thorns. So now it can grow, it can get in there, it can get, get roots, but what happens when you have weeds next to good plants? What do the weeds do? <laughs> they kill the good plant, they choke it out, they take its life, and the weed grows and blossoms and blooms. And Jesus relates this to what? The worries of this age, deceitfulness of wealth, riches, glory, honor, sex, whatever it might be, that dries it out, kills it, chokes it, and, and puts it out. And then you have the seed that falls on the good ground. This is someone who hears, who understands the word, and produces fruit and yields. Now, I don't want you to miss this part because Jesus doesn't just stop and say, well, it just produces fruit. He says, some produce 100, some produce 60, some produce 30. All of those are, are multiplication of what was sown. In other words, they shouldn't be producing anywhere near this much. They're producing 30 times, 60 times, 100 times. It is miraculous how much fruit is being produced. Why? Because Jesus doesn't want you to hear that and go, all right, I'm the good soil. I'm going to produce 100 times. I got, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that, right? Because it's the Spirit. It's miraculous. It's God. It's God growing it and making it amazing. I'm reminded of the passage Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 3, um, where he just simply says this. And there's a controversy in the church about teachers, pastors, leaders that people are attaching to and say, oh, I prefer his teaching style or I prefer his teaching style. And what does Paul say? What then is Apollos? 1 Corinthians 3 verse 5. What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted the seed, so to speak. Apollos watered, but who gave the growth? God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. So, so what does Paul relate this idea to? Hey, well, I might preach, but your growth has nothing to do with me. It is an act of God. It is the work of the Spirit. So I want to draw our attention to this because here's my main lesson for disciples and then we're going to kind of hit on this little piece and then we'll be done. My main lesson that I want us to chew on, all right, and, and then just is, is very practical. We need to ask Jesus in prayer for the blessing, as he said to the disciples, of eyes that see and ears that hear. Okay, because without God moving and giving us eyes to see and ears to hear, we're going to get in our own way. 
I, I think of this, this parable of the sower, and I, I want to start where it begins because Jesus starts with the sower went out to sow, right? The sower went out to sow. In other words, the sower is doing what he always does. That's why he's called a sower. Right? The sower is going, he, he's going and he's casting seed. That's what sowers do. And, and, and he's doing what he always does and he's casting seeds. So this is a daily, habitual, regular activity. God is always preaching to us. I, I'm reminded of the psalmist saying, the heavens and the earth, you know, uh, uh, sing the praises of the glory of God. They're constantly preaching to us. Even though they don't have mouths, they can't speak, but they're constantly speaking the glory of God, Right? The very heaven and earth is preaching to us about who God is all the time. The, the reality is we, you guys in church hear the word every Sunday. And I was going to do this cool thing if we were all here. I was going to bring a bag of seeds and I was going to throw seeds out to everybody. And, you know, now I can't do that. So just imagine that that's happening, right? You receive the word every week. The question is, are you hearing? Are you seeing? What soil do you bring in when you hear the word of God, right? And at the end of the day, I, I do believe there is a part of it where you, you praying and you seeking the Lord and inviting him to open your heart and your mind and your ears really matters. I almost pray that every Sunday that God would do that for us in the service because what does that Isaiah passage say? They're closing their ears and their eyes, right? La, 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 I don't want to hear God. I don't want to hear, Right? And how many times have I come into church and I've been the path? I've been, the, the seed was cast, the, the sower was doing his part and I was the path, right? And the reality is I didn't want to hear it. I wasn't interested. There was a football game on later in the day. I, my Cowboys are going to play today and they're going to win. Just mark my words. But besides the point, I was the path, right? And I didn't care. And the devil took an opportunity and said, sweet, I'm taking that word. And I'm snatching it right up. There's been many times I've been the stone. Man, I hear what you're saying, God, but I'm not, just not willing to go through what you're asking me to go through. I'm not willing to suffer, suffer that persecution. I'm not willing to suffer that hardship. I'm not willing to suffer that. I hear your word. I see what it says. I, I know what it's calling me to do. I know the faith it's calling me to walk out on, but I'm just not willing to suffer the consequences for doing it. Or, or, or the weeds, man, the weeds. The weeds get you so much. You come to church, you're ready. You hear, the word comes, it grows, but you got other things in your life that are gods. You've got other gods that are calling out your name when you go home, whatever it is. I don't know what it is for you. It could be wealth. That's what Jesus mentions here, the wealth and the riches and the anxieties of the world. You can go back to work on Monday and go and just completely forget everything you heard. You know, the weeds are just choking it out. Those other gods you have in your life that you bow down to during the week, they're choking out that word, right? Sometimes you're the, fruit, the, the good soil, but who brings the growth? Can we take any credit that when God sows the seed, he's the sower and then the land's in the good soil and God's growing that into something awesome and producing 30, 60, 100 times what we expected? No, we just get to receive it with joy. But I believe it all begins with asking Jesus for the blessing of eyes that see and ears that hear because I don't see in this passage, some people read this and they say, well, this is just how you are. So if you're a path, you're always a path, right? That's just how you are. Jesus doesn't want you to hear. You're a path. You're gonna stay a path. The devil's gonna snatch the word and, and that's just where it is. But I don't see that here. The sower goes out to sow. It's what the sower does. The sower is casting the word all the time. And what amazing grace of God that even though he knows you're not going to accept it, he still casts it your way, right? But we got to come with humility and pray, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I don't have the, the mental faculties, the, the physical faculties to accept and, and to, to receive with joy and to produce fruit and, and do that with you. I just don't have it. You have to work. You have to work. And so I... I want to invite you into that prayer because, man, for all of us, when we open the word of God on Sunday, during the week, whenever, and we hear what God is saying to us, that's, that's a seed being cast our way. Right? That's God saying, come walk with me, come grow with me. And I, if we don't invite the spirit to say, hey, please open my eyes. 
Now, there are times he'll do it anyway, by the way, <laughs> without you asking. And those times are even more <laughs> world-shaking when, when there's nothing you said and the Spirit just was like, yep, here it is, and, and takes you there. And that's awesome. But we want that, right? We want God to move. And so praying and seeking earnestly and, and taking our hands off our ears and saying, I don't want to just ignore it because it doesn't sound great to me and I don't want to go through it. But just saying, God, give me the truth. So as we go through this parable series, we're going to be in Psalm 119 with David praying, God, teach me your statutes. God, teach me your ways. God, help me with your spirit. God, guide me and give me a heart that loves what you love. And so I, I ask you to join me in that. Pray with me and we'll close up. God, I just ask that, man, that pe the people who are listening right now, they wouldn't just hear me. What do I know? God, but that they would hear your spirit. That they would sit with this parable, God, this week, and, and that your spirit would move and just reveal truth to them. Lord, as we go through this series on parables, as a pastor, I'm selfish here. I'm gonna pray and, and ask, God, that you move through my words and speak truth in the parables because Simply put, I couldn't handle the truth in the way Jesus does. I, I, I need you to speak. But God, for all of us, God, as we approach the word, as we, as we seek you out, as we say, Lord, God, what do you want me to hear? Help us, God, because old paths can be broken up. God, and, and rocks can be removed and weeds can be killed. God, and I, and I just seek that for all of us. That as you want in your timing to reveal truth to us, in your way, in your will. God, that you would open our hearts, remove those burdens, those barriers, and help us not just hear the truth, but live in it, breathe it. God, walk in it every day. You're an awesome God. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.